Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce Jamie Lee Curtis. Over the course of a successful career spanning genres and decades, Jamie Lee Curtis has starred in such films as Halloween, Trading Places, A Fish Called Wanda, My Girl, and True Lies, for which she won a Best Actress Golden Globe. On TV, she co-starred in the acclaimed comedy series Anything But Love, many episodes of New Girl and NCIS, and she currently stars in Scream Queens on Fox. And best of all, for us here today, she's also a New York Times best-selling author of children's books that include When I Was Little, a four-year-old's memoir of her youth, Tell Me Again About the Night I Was Born, and Big Words for Little People. Her new book, This Is Me, raises more important than ever issues of identity, immigration, inclusive culture, and adventure. When giving the commencement address to students of New York Film Academy's LA campus in 2013, she said, this isn't about a show, it's about truth and integrity and honesty and communication, bravery and risk, and adjectives that should make you get out of bed in the morning, excited to be what it is you choose to be. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jamie Lee Curtis. Wow. Thank you so much. Wow. Hi, everybody. So that was weird. So I'm standing back there listening. I'm like, wow, who's she talking about? I was like, wow, I want to know her. That's fabulous. I loved that when she said it spanned decades, many people in the audience chuckled. Basically, I don't see a kid here. You guys aren't kids. OK, there's one person. Because you guys are like, uh, hold on. Hi. Well, there are a few young people. I see one there now. I see one hiding there next to the lady. No, no, I'm, uh, there's one there. Okay, good. But the reason why I brought it up is that the sort of generational laughter, of course, is when you hear the word decade associated with you, you go, ah, right, been here a little bit. Um, for the young people, in the audience. We already know that the old people in the audience, and I say old, is the communal old. Um, for you young people here today, I'm going to kind of establish my street cred with you, and then you guys will be really quiet and look at me like, really? You might even look up at your mommy or your daddy or your auntie or your sister and go like, really? Who is she? She's a little weird. So this is just my gift to those young people in the room. I'm doing this mic, people don't freak out because I needed it a little closer for 10 seconds. I was warned about the microphone. So <clears throat> just to establish that I'm weird, that I uh, am creative and silly, um, how old is the baby? The baby is two months, four months, or six months. Let me ask one of the young children. Raise your hand. How old is the baby today? Two, four, or six? Yes, young boy. Four month old. And is the baby angry, uh, happy, tired, hungry, or poopy and wet? <laughs> and the man in the pink shirt said all of them. I heard a child laugh, that's the point. So this is a four month old, all of the above baby for your listening pleasure. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now they're all listening. Because now they're like, wait, what? So the wait, <laughs> that laugh is why I'm here. <laughs> and I paid that child to laugh right at that moment. 
because a child to me means laughter and innocence and joy and crying and wet, poopy, tired, irritable, all the rest. But it's really the laughter and the joy and the experience of being alive, which is embodied in a child. And it's the reason all of us, as we get older, look longingly at those very children with that missing our own, if we were all lucky enough to have them, or even if we're grandparents, that beginning of separating, which is the circle of life, which is the beginning, middle, and an end, which is beautiful and is the glory of being alive. And I will tell you for the uh, people here that care, um, you know, I've been an actor a long time. Uh, for the children in the room, you understand what it means, some of them, to be an actor, to be a pretender, to, if you see a movie, to all these young people in the room, if you end up showing them Beverly Hills Chihuahua, <laughs> or maybe Freaky Friday, um, I am not that person. I'm actually named Jamie, but in the movie I pretended to be that person. You're really a pretender. Um, so I have a beautiful life. I am married for a very long time to a talented person um, who probably everybody in this room will go see his movie on October 13th called Mascots. Um, my husband, Christopher Guest, has a brand new movie debuting, I believe, October 13th or thereabout rush out and see it, it's super funny about the life of people who are those sports mascots under the foam heads. <laughs> You're already laughing and you haven't seen the movie. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have a very happy life. I have a husband, I have children, um, and uh, I was very content with my busy life of being an actor and a mother and a daughter and a sister and a wife and a mommy. And being a mommy is the absolute greatest job of my life, bar none. And when my four-year-old, who here is four? Anybody got a four-year-old in the room? We got a four-year-old right there? Love four-year-olds. So when my four-year-old was four, I know that makes no sense. <laughs> but it did to you. Um, when my little girl Annie was four years old, this is what happened. She stomped, and yes, four-year-olds stomp a lot. My four-year-old stomped into my office where I was sitting one day, and this is what happened. She went like this. remember where I was sitting. And I remember she left the room. And I thought, wait, what? <laughs> like, that's nuts. Because, you see, all she looked to me was little. You know, my four-year-old, when you have a small child, all you're doing is looking ahead. From the day they're born, you're looking ahead. Their clothes stop fitting, like a week later, right? You get these clothes, you think, okay, I'm set. And then you put on the same onesie a week later, it doesn't fit. And you're like, oh, better go to the Gap and get all those on sale onesies, and you buy them for three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months, because you're looking forward now, like, oh, right. She's gonna grow and need clothes, and, 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 and. Then she's gonna need to eat food. No more liquid, now it's thing, then it's baby food, then it's this, then it's this. School, where's she gonna, oh, she needs to go to a preschool. Oh, but then they need to go to kindergarten, then they need to go to school, then they have to go to college. You know, you're just looking ahead the whole time. And you're trying to catch up because they're, on, you know, they're growing and, and you're just always looking ahead, very rare. How often do you go, oh, wow, I, w I wish they were who they were? Because you're so delighted with their development. You're so thrilled the first time they grab the rattle. 
You know, today we would be tweeting and Instagramming and videoing in, Snapchatting, the grabbing of the rattle. Back then we just were like, oh, she grabbed the rattle! She's gonna go to college! Because <laughs> prior to that she couldn't grab the rattle. So when my four-year-old came in and declared her past, I wrote on a piece of paper on a pad, when I was a little, a four-year-old's memoir of her youth. So it made me laugh, because she was talking about her youth the way we talk about high school and college. Four years. The way I talk about shags and bell-bottoms. Yeah, back in the day, it was a lot of James Taylor and bell-bottoms. And you know, she was talking about being like the distant past and all I looked for was her future. And I wrote a list on a piece of paper. By the way, 8, 7, 8, 40 combined on my SATs. <laughs> combined. <laughs> you take the two numbers, you add them together. That's your score. Barely got out of high school, got into the only college. My mother was the most famous person to have ever graduated from. L obviously not was going to have a career in the letters. Couldn't even put the letters in the right order, if you know what I'm saying. Wink, wink, wink. Um, and here I wrote a list. When I was little, a four-year-old's memoir for youth, and I wrote when I was little I could do this, couldn't do this, now I can do this, blah, 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 blah. And at the end of the list, I wrote three things that I started to cry. I wrote, when I was little, I didn't know what a family was. When I was little, I didn't know what dreams were. When I was little, I didn't know who I was. But now I do. And all of a sudden, I have tears pouring down my face. And I went, oh, this is a book for children. That's how I became an author. The girl with the 840 combined SAT score. <laughs> you see, it moved me, and it made me laugh. And that is the criteria by which I judge my work. My work now, I'm an author. I've written 12 bucks. I was going to use the friggin' word, but which I understand is some sort of a kind of combo word, um, which is appropriate. It's in the dictionary, at least the one I have <laughs> at home, which I rarely use because I can't really spell very well. Anyway, my point is that I never expected to be who I am today. And I've had the great, great pleasure of being an author. The last thing in the world I thought I'd ever do would be to write books. And now I've written a bunch of them and they're wonderful. They're my best thing. Besides my children, they are my best thing. They are the best embodiment of who I am, what I think, how I look at the world. And I partnered up with a brilliant illustrator who illustrated a children's book that my daughter was given on the day she was born, which was called Annie Banani. If you don't have it, read it. It's called Annie Banani by Leah Kamiko, and it's a book about best friends having to say goodbye. And my little girl Annie received it on her birthday, and I've read that book a thousand times to Annie Guest, and that book was illustrated by Laura Cornell, who is my brilliant partner, the woman who made every one of my books come to life with her art. Now, for the children in the room, do you know the difference between an author and an illustrator? Young ones in the front. Uh, on the left, the 11-year-old, what does an author do? Okay, and uh, 13, uh, 14 in purple, and what does the illustrator do? She draws the, the pictures. So I just need to, like full disclosure, I can draw a stick figure, a unisex stick figure, before that was a thing. If it's Chris, tell him I won't be home for a week. Um, so that's how I'm here today, by the way. I'm not Bruce Springsteen, who apparently is coming to town. If you don't have your tickets, guess what? It's sold out. Yeah, I'd laugh too. Um, 
But I'm here because I'm an author, and I'm here because I have a wonderful new book. So this new book, which I'm really excited about, which is published on Tuesday, this is the first event I'm doing in support of this work. This is the first time I will ever read it out loud. But before we do anything, well, no, you know what? I'm going to read it and then ask a couple questions and then tell you about this book. So this book is called This Is Me, the story. It's a story, but it's for me the story of who we are and where we came from. And it is written by me, and it is illustrated by my brilliant partner, Laura Cornell. And it goes like this. <clears throat> my great-grandmother came from a far distant place. She came on a boat with just this small case. Great-grandmother left her family and friends to cross the great sea to a land at the end. Her parents informed her she had no say. Tomorrow we leave for a place far away. So fill up this case with things you love best and sadly, you'll have to leave all of the rest. Did she wear all her clothes to save her more space? Could her family album fit in this case? I know she took ribbons and some things to eat and shoes when they said to take care of your feet. Her whole family tree, pen and pencil set, one writing journal, a comb and barrette great-great-grandma's necklace, her own handmade doll that she clutched on her journey when she felt very small. How did she do it? What would you take? Would you be scared that you'd make a mistake? How would you know in this case what to pack that once you had left, there'd be no turning back? So you, my dear class, have big choices to make. When you bring this case home, what would you take? And now the book goes into the rooms of each of the students. The first kid's name is Trey. I couldn't take paintings or Diglett, my rat, or trophies or school books or dad's hand-carved bat. Then Shanae's room. I take lots of photos and the doll my gram sewed and my first in line ticket to Katie's first show. For those adults in the room, her name is Katie Perry. She is a popular singer. I think she sings. She sing? She sings. Sorry. Then Kate's room. My punk rob my punk rocker Barbie, because my mom was one too. My barely stuffed bear, old Winnie the Pooh. Then Roberto's room. Abuelo's beret, my ukulele, my St. Christopher medal to look out for me. Then Corinne's, oh no, excuse me, then Ty's room. My USA passport that makes me feel free, my Nintendo DS with my fave Luigi. Yes, I have a son. How did you know? In Corinne's room, it says, my signed Harry Potter, my baby tooth tin, my aunt's high school class ring, my dad's navy pin. And then in Luke's room, my Groucho Marx glasses, Weird Al signed CD, my Notre Dame jersey, my karate gi. And then in Ali's room, Legos, a camera to film what I leave. If this really happened, it'd be hard to believe. And then in Elena's room. Oh, she's now brought it into the classroom, Elena. But I'd be so excited with all that was new and people and things to meet and to do. And then the teacher back again says, great work, Elena, for the time that you took. This suitcase is like your own history book. For who you all are isn't just what you've got, but part what you learn, part what you're taught. Who you become starts with your past, family histories, stories that last. This great tide that brought you, seeds ancestors sowed, 
that took root inside you and helped you to grow. Now you take this case and imagine it's true that you're leaving and needing to choose what says you. What would you take? Which things would they be that says to the world? And then there's a suitcase at the back of the book. Hi there, this is me. So, what this book is, is an identity kit, if you will. You know, I'm of the age now where I am very much established who I am. And as we get older, you know, we very much, I hope, it's the reason why we go through high school, was not a good time. <laughs> you know, to find out who we are through adversity, through accolades and accomplishments, through loss, through birth, it establishes who we are and what we care about. And we live in a country where we're allowed to say who we are and what we care about. And for me, the story that all of us share is that we all came from someplace else. Every single one of us in this room, their ancestors weren't from here. They were from someplace else. And the adventure of their lives were to leave where they were from and to come to America. And this book is really about the promise of freedom and the ability to establish who you are and the joy of establishing who you are. And for me, it's an, uh, the term I would use for it is an object lesson. It's a way to use items as a way to say this is who I am. So I'll give you a couple examples of what I would take in my suitcase before I open it up and let you ask questions. Um, so uh, the first couple things that come to mind is my first edition of Go Dog Go. Now I don't know how many people in this room have ever read Go Dog Go by P.D. Eastman. Um, it is a book for children. It's an easy reader book. Um, I guess that's why I like it. <laughs> um, and what I love about it, and I loved about it when I was little, and this I truly remember, like one of the first things I can remember is reading this book, which is a book about opposites. It's about um, big dogs and little dogs, dogs that are in, dogs that are out, up, you know, dogs that are up and down. It's a book of opposites. And then in the middle of this book, for no reason whatsoever, a dog walks up to another dog and says, hello, hello, do you like my hat? <laughs> no, I do not like that hat. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Seriously. What? When I was little, I got that joke. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that solidified my sense of humor. I think it was like finding the holy grail and going like, oh, it explained the world to me. Do you like my hat? There's just something so weird about it and me that I would love the non sequitur, do you like my hat, in a book about opposites. And then, by the way, halfway through the book, up, down, hot, cold, in, out, hello again, hello again. Now do you like my hat? Nope, I do not like that hat. Goodbye, goodbye, again. And then, of course, at the end of the book, there's a big dog party, and they're all up a tree, uh, and they go up the tree, and then at the big dog party, once again, hello again, hello. Now do you like my hat? Yes, I do. I do like that party hat. Goodbye, goodbye. Somehow, for whatever weird reason, 
That book spoke to me when I was a child and speaks to me today about the randomness of humor and about uh, the joy of knowing that that's who I was when I was little, that I loved it. So that would go in my suitcase. I have a first edition of that book. I would put my first edition of East of Eden, um, which I think is the most beautiful book ever written and has some of the most beautiful, uh, weirdly enough, op-ed prose in the middle of this book that you're like, wait, what? Um, wonderful book by John Steinbeck. Um, I would probably try to fill my suitcase with first editions of books since we're in a library and we're in the best library and the Philadelphia Free Library. And I am honored to be standing here in the Philadelphia Free Library on the launching event of my new book. So thank you for having me, Philadelphia. I, by the way, just so you know, when books are published, the people that publish them, called publishers, I knew that. I got that one right on my SATs. Do you know that the first call they make the Today Show to get, try to get their authors on. Second call they make, Philadelphia Free Library. Because you guys book up so fast. And it is such a coveted place to bring your written work. So I've been told about the Philadelphia Free Library for a very long time, and I'm thrilled to be here. So I would fill my suitcase with books if I could, but that would take up the whole suitcase. And that isn't what I can do. So there are a couple other things. Um, for the adults in the room, uh, you all know who my parents were. Um, thank you. And my parents were once married. Yes, to each other and to 12 other people. <laughs> I'm doing the math now. <laughs> I didn't do well on that part of the SAT. But there was a moment where you're right, they were married to each other, and I apparently liked each other a little. Um, and there was a little gold box that my father gave my mother, and it says Janet Hart Tony on it. And my mother had it all these years, even though their marriage ended and they all married other, many other people. <laughs> um, for some reason, my mother kept it, and I don't know the story of it or why it was a gift, but somehow it represents my parents. Golden, shiny, beautiful. Um, seriously, you know, uh, for when you have famous parents and you have nothing but pictures of them, those pictures don't really mean anything. They feel very contrived and very, you know, fake, because it was a machine. But this object lesson meant something to her, to keep it, and when she passed on, uh, it meant something to me. I would take that, and I have filled it with my grandmother's wedding rings, my baby necklace from when I was in the hospital, uh, gifts from my children, my son, my daughter, each gave me small objects. My mother used to wear a pendant around her neck uh, that had my birth year, my sister's birth year, and my mother's birth year and date, and our birthstones, a, a medallion she used to wear whenever she traveled as her safety um, object. I would put that in the little gold box. So I would fill the gold box with obviously a lot of those personal mementos. Uh, there's a beautiful plate my daughter gave me um, that says live the life you've always dreamed, um, Thoreau. Um, and it's a beautiful plate and I love it. Um, I have a framed photograph of my sister, my sister Kelly. Um, when I got married, I just sounded like I was from New Jersey. <laughs> I'm from Los Angeles. I must be closer to New Jersey than I am to Los Angeles, and all of a sudden I'm picking up, the, like all of a sudden I'm gonna be on the Today Show saying, when I was married <laughs> so long ago, oi, when I was married, wow, what was I, oh, I know. The, my wedding gift from my father was something I asked for, which was that the only time in my entire adult life, my entire life on the planet Earth, that my entire family was in one room was at my wedding. And that was the gift I asked for from my dad. I said I would like all my siblings, and you, and my mother, and my stepfather, and my 
my, you know, stepfather's mother and my sister and my husband's entire family all in one room. And that was, so I have a photograph. And by the way, nobody's looking at the camera. I mean, it's one of those things where we took it quick. I remember we kind of were taking pictures. It was not a fancy wedding. And it was that thing where it's like, okay, let's just all get in one picture. And you know, somebody's got a baby and somebody's turning this way and somebody's talking. I mean, it's just this, it's kind of a perfect photograph, if you will, of my family. But it meant something to me, obviously, and it would be probably the second thing I'd put. Go dog, go, and then maybe my family portrait. Go dog, go, though. Come on. <laughs> Come on. So, um, and uh, you know, obviously, other small items that are important to me. But just to give you an idea of what was important to me, that if I needed to plant myself like a seed somewhere new, those would be the objects that I would choose. Now, the book obviously is for young people, and it is about adventure, about just even the beginning sense of who are we and what's important to us. And so the book, what I love is that it has the suitcase in the back, and so when you take the book home tonight, or if your grandparents, when you have your grandchildren come over, or you go to their house, you get the opportunity to really talk about this stuff. Tell them what you would take. Fill the suitcase up yourself. It's a small little suitcase at the back of the book in order to fit it into the book so that the book wasn't un, you know, unwieldy, unwieldy, right? There's no L. 840. <laughs> um, you know, it's a small suitcase, but it does, oh, and I'm a, a photographer and I put my Leica M6 in there and it fit. So, you know, that's what the book is. It's about communication. It's about us talking about who we were and who we are, and what our grandparents gave us, and what we have on our own. So it's, it, that's the intention of the book. It's an, in, it's an inclusion book. It's a book for families. It's a book, um, really, um, about our identities and how we form them as we get older and, and decide who we are. So, that's my new book for children. This is the first time, God bless you, I have ever read it or been in a room of people. And it is time for me now, correct? Where is he? See, I'm, I am, I'm telling you, I am my, I'm like, I am my own map quest. You should like, I never, people say to me, oh, I use Waze. I'm like, Waze? I am Waze. And I have people call me. And no joke, I'm such a good Waze person and MapQuest, what's the other one? Google app, Google app. I scoff at you. I am Google apps. And there was a day where my sister worked with me uh, for 10 years as my assistant. Um, she was a, a way overqualified person, but you know, I. At, for a period of time needed a full-time assistant and it came with benefits and I kept saying I'd rather pay you she was looking for a job it was like hello hi over here sister anyway my assistant and she's my kid's aunt so it's really she's my assister aunt um, Kelly whose picture I would put in my suitcase a picture of us on a bike where I'm sitting on the seat and she was riding me you know the way you do beautiful picture. Um, uh, my sister and I were talking on the cell phone, hands-free, and we were driving someplace, and we were yakking, and I was trying to navigate the city of Lahangalese, where I live, and I am known to back down alleys, and you know, you don't want to know people like me, and I am circumnavigating traffic and going down an alley and then a one-way street and then another alley and I'm literally going behind three streets of buildings going down an alley and I'm talking to her on the phone and I'm saying we have to do this and we have to do that and we have to do this and all of a sudden I see a car coming and I'm like ah oh, somebody's in my way and I <laughs> look up and it's my sister <laughs> two LA girls so Anyway, I do not always write in verse. My first two books, when I was little, a four-year-old's memoir of her youth, 
and Tell Me Again About the Night I Was Born, which is a book about how a family is built through adoption. I did not write in verse, and I never thought I'd write in verse, and it was not a you know, direct homage to Go Dog Go or Dr. Seuss or anything. And then what happened was I was working on a third book idea, because now all of a sudden I'm a writer. Who knew? And now I have ideas. Wow. And I had an idea because the secret sauce, by the way, to the books that I write, the secret sauce is that there's two lines of music. There's a line of music for the children and there's a line of music for the adults. Because when you're reading a book, an adult with a child, how many adults, please raise your hand, have read books over and over again that you just want to burn? And I know you don't, we would never do that. But you know what I am saying, like you just can't imagine you have to read that book again. That's how I felt a lot of the time with children's books, is that they are children's books. But you see, picture books are meant to be read by adults to children. And in that, I always felt like the adults were being left out. And so without knowing it, I only uh, analyzed this later, the books that I write are actually written for both children and adults. For instance, my biggest seller, my, my, my blockbuster, <laughs> and yes, I have a blockbuster. My biggest uh, and best-selling book <clears throat> was called Today I Feel Silly and other moods that make my day. There's a dirty, hairy reference in the title of my blockbuster book for children. <laughs> they don't know it, but their parents do. That's my secret sauce, just so you know, is that I write for children, but the illustrations have secret, for instance, in the book about balloons, which is a great book, by the way, and has an app that you can buy that's amazing, um, called Where Do Balloons Go? An Uplifting Mystery, where the balloons go up into the sky and float far away, and the child says, you know, where do they go? At one point, the, the stanza of the book is, where do they go when they float far away? Do they ever catch cold, need somewhere to stay? Well, guess where they're staying? Bates Motel. <laughs> you see what I am saying? But that's my point, is that the music is for both. So when you're an adult, you find these books delightful to read because you find all these funny references that, quite honestly, it doesn't, you know, a young person is not going to know what Bates Motel is, and nor should they. <laughs> and please don't tell them. Um, <clears throat> What happened was I was thinking about my next book. And the reason I told you that whole little story just now was that the next book I was going to write was going to be called My Mood Swing. <laughs> the adults laugh. The children would think it meant that there was a swing that you could sit on and it might change your mood. And that was my idea, that it was going to be called My Mood Swing and it was going to be about how every day we feel differently. And that one day you're happy, one day you're not so happy, one day you're quiet, one day you're loud, in my case, often. <laughs> to that point, I couldn't get it. I kept trying to write the book, and I'm one of those people where my first two books just popped out of my head. When my daughter said that four-year-old thing, that list was done. I was crying at the end of it in two and a half minutes. And I was like, oh, wow, that's a book. That's how they come out of my head. I don't think about them. So here I was trying to think, because I'm a writer now. I'm an author. And I'm, that's serious work. No joking. I need, you know, according to F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald and, you know, other people, I need a couple whiskeys and a, a solitude and some cabin out in the woods by myself where I'm going to write. And I was trying to write this book, My Mood Swing, and what happened was a friend came over, my friend Alan Oppenheimer, yes, Alan Oppenheimer from New York, 
uh, was visiting his, his friend Deborah Oppenheimer, who is the dedicatee of this book. Um, and Alan Oppenheimer said to me, what are you working on? And I said, well, I've got this idea for a new book. He goes, oh, what is it? I said, oh, it's called My Mood Swing. And I said, you know, it really just needs to be simple. It really should just be something like, today I feel silly. Mom says it's the heat. I put rouge on the cat and gloves on my feet. I ate pancakes for breakfast and, I mean, I ate pancakes for dinner and noodles. All of a sudden, I was like, I'll be right back. And I ran, I laid down on the floor in my kitchen, and I wrote the book, Today I Feel Silly. Like in two minutes, popped in my head, all of it, boom. But it wasn't, and that's when I started writing it in verse, because prior to that, I hadn't written in verse. All of a sudden, the only thing I heard in my head was verse. So now I write all in verse because that's what pops into my head. And I can't get it out. I'm trying, I'm trying. I but just want anyway. you to know that one of the things that I would put in my suitcase would be a fish called Wanda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ah. Did you have as much fun making it? And did you have to do scenes over and over because you were all breaking up? Well... <clears throat> Thank you. That's beautiful. Um, so the truth of the matter is, yes, it was very fun. Uh, I will tell you to this day that Kevin Klein won't speak to me because I ruined more funny things he did by laughing. So if any of you follow anything that I do in the world of social media, you will see that now when I work with comedians and I have to do a scene with them, I hold a pin, a push pin between my fingers and I push on it really hard to stop from laughing. And I do a comedy TV show now and when comedians come in and I know they're gonna improvise funny stuff, I'm always like, can I get a push pin please? Thank you. And then if you see my hand is sort of like this, I'm actually pushing really, really, really hard a push pin into my finger because it will make me laugh so hard. So it was fun, but for the, all the moms in the room, my daughter was six months old. We went to London um, to make this movie, and all I remember about A Fish Called Wanda, honestly, was crying because I would get up at, you know, five o'clock in the morning and be in a car by 5.30 for an hour's drive to the studio, leaving my crying baby in the hands of a nanny or my husband. And I would work 12, 13, 14 hours and then take an hour's ride home and get home and she would be asleep. It was very, very difficult. I, I, I appreciate working mothers. Of course, most working mothers have to work. You know, the regrets I have is that I worked when my kids were little, and it was very challenging for me, and I've never figured it out. Um, and so unfortunately, my memory of a fish called Wanda was understanding the pain of separation with my baby and really that I really, my place was to be with her, to, to bond and to enjoy her littleness. And I just miss it, you know, and I just remember crying and crying and crying and crying and then laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing and then crying and crying and crying, which I guess, as Joni Mitchell would say, laughing and crying, you know it's the same release. And then I could tell you the rest of the lyrics. I told you when I met you I was crazy, cry for us all, beauty, cry for Eddie, sorry. I'm digressing, I'm going a little Joni on us. Some of the kids are like. Hi, um, Mom. it actually happened to me when I was 12 years old. My parents literally picked up and left Russia for yes. the life in America. And I literally had to pack my bag. Um, and you know, now as an adult looking back, I think back when my parents, you know, they were really scared. They mm -hmm. took, you know, basic needs, mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> some canned food, toilet paper, soap, you know, just basic things because they weren't sure, you know, with the propaganda in Russia, like, are we going to die? What are we going to eat? 
and some keepsakes. And now, you know, many years later, I um, think, what a waste of space, you know? Right. All well, those things they took, they thought were important, but really it's those few pieces of keepsake, and they allowed me to take a little doll, and I still have it, of oh, course. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Do you have um, a picture of it? I don't, but oh, I wanted to, to um, tell you that the most important thing that you were really able to take is memories, and you can't even pack them. Mm. And I actually wrote, and I want to send with the volunteer, I wrote um, a little, like a skit as a joke about what it was like to pack those um, oh, please. suitcases, and you will appreciate it. I will appreciate it <laughs> so much. He wrote about that, and I just, um, I, while I think it's the most important thing to ponder what you would put in those suitcases, sure. I think it's the most traumatic experience of, of real life, and um, I think we're so blessed, those that are born in this country yes. and don't have to do that. Absolutely, and let me be very clear, as a card-carrying member of, of the United States and the political process that we are all entering. <laughs> it is the nature of our country, which is our country was founded on conflict and the promise of a new world. Um, the situation globally has changed since I wrote this book and so it has become very timely. The book is for four to six year olds who really aren't aware of the political situation in the world. And this book is not intended, by the way, to try to unpack that for them because there were people who came here simply on the promise. They were not escaping, they were not fleeing from a dangerous situation. They literally came here because the promise of freedom and the ability to choose what you did was tempting. And so, obviously, I'm highly aware of what you talked about. I can't wait to read it. And I am, you know, aware that we are having the second greatest migration of human beings in history going on right now only smaller than the Second World War. So I'm highly aware of that, and I just want to assure you that the book is intended for young children to, as an object lesson, to really f say, today, who am I? What's important to me? What might I take with me? But on no level does it address the seriousness of exodus, of, of, persecution, et cetera. It's, a, it's, a, it's truly a book for young children to just explore that beginning sense of identity. And I appreciate so much what you said, and I'm very uh, looking forward. I'll read it on my uh, trip up to New York, or down. Up. Hey, 840, you guys. I knew it was near. I knew to do the accent. I couldn't tell you if it was up, down, sideways, or... No, I, I would have said up. I mean, I know we're Philadelphia. I'm, I've got it a little. But again, I'm from California. You know what I'm saying? Uh, when and why did you decide to leave showbiz and become a writer? And have you had contact with uh, Ziggy Morley at some point? Yes. Bob Morley's son? Yes, I have. Okay. So um, Ziggy Marley um, loves my writing. And I actually wrote a beautiful, beautiful book called Is There Really a Human Race? Which is a book about competition and a book about this insatiable need to beat each other at things. And it's a great book for children. And he included it. He had me come and read it on one of his albums. And it was a real thrill for me to have him include that book on one of his albums to talk about peace. Um, I'm s sorry? Yes, the name of the album is called Family Time, yes. I have not left show off business, <laughs> just so you know. I actually am still actively showing off. Um, and I show off on this TV show called Scream Queens, um, which is funny, a little dark, and, and wildly inappropriate for those two young girls who left in the front row and 
way too over, way too young, uh, pro inappropriate for you, young man. Anyway, um, it, you know, it's a funny adult, young adult, mid-age young adult, uh, TV show comedy, horror comedy, inappropriate, 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 inappropriate. Which, by the way, is one of the, one of the words in my book for children called Big Words for Little People, which is about the fact that I think we dumb down our little people by not giving them the language that our forefathers uh, established for us and it's a book about using big words for little people, and one of the big words I love is inappropriate um, uh, and appropriate, and what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. And if I had done the show Scream Queens at the time, I would have included it in the inappropriate um, column, What if is you it will. like working on a show like Scream Queens? Inappropriate. <laughs> daily. So I do this TV show that's pretty wacky. Um, but what's particularly wacky is that the writing is so good. And it's socially relevant, even though it's wildly inappropriate. Um, and it's super funny. And it is filled with talent. Now, I'm just going to be perfectly honest. You know, it was very easy for us as we get old to disparage the young <laughs> for being sort of, you know what I mean? Like we feel like we really worked hard, you know, and there's this whole thing about these millennials, you know, slackers and all this, right? So here we are, you know, when I was your age, how many in this room has said when I was your age? <laughs> Seriously, come on, people, <laughs> right? We've all said it because when we were their age, we worked hard, and now they don't. But the truth is, <clears throat> so the first day of shooting on this TV show, and the show is filled with young actors, none of whom I knew, but I knew their names. Emma Roberts, Kiki Palmer, Abigail Breslin. I'd seen Abigail Breslin in um, Little Miss Sunshine. But do you know what I mean? Kiki Palmer, Ariana Grande. Didn't know any of these people. And the first day of shooting, I have a four-page scene with Emma Roberts. The first scene you see in Scream Queens between me and Emma was that literally we walked on set. There she was. I went, you know, I went, hi. Whoa. That's another thing when you get our age. Something that high throws us off. Isn't it amazing? I would say just get rid of the little tiny riser. I don't know why you have it. I was warned about it, but seriously. <laughs> that you have to warn us in a court of law would not be in your favor. I understand pre-warning is pre, whatever is it, pre-armed, whatever. Forewarned is for, whatever. You all did better than me in school. But I didn't know, I literally introduced myself. Hi, I'm Jamie. Hi, I'm Emma. Sit down, Ryan Murphy's like, okay, I want it fast and go. And I sat there, and this girl was astonishing. I sat there, and you know, who here plays any sort of sport like tennis? I know it's tennis or ping pong or anything where you actually, basketball, you like play back and forth. You guys are looking at me like I'm talking, like <laughs> it's a game. It's called tennis. <laughs> you bounce the ball. You hit it. It bounces on their side, they hit it back. It's fun! <laughs> Goodness me, people. Anyway, you know, when you're acting, you say your stuff, then they say theirs, and then, and I almost couldn't speak because she was so amazing. So the thing that has been the biggest thrill for me is how talented these young people are. And by the way, when I was a young actor, you were an actor. Now, they are singers, dancers, they have music videos, they have 
internet channels, they write books, they do musicals, they have contracts with commercials, they do coach ads. It's crazy, the multitasking that this group of young people do. So I'm wildly impressed with them. So the great pleasure for me is I get to do this super, super funny show with really talented young people. And it just makes me happy. Yeah. First, I just want to say my name is Wanda. Ah. <laughs> And I haven't seen that movie yet, but I've had to live with it, Wanda the Fish, and we used to be Wanda the Witch. I can't say at least my name is spelt different. That's what I tell people, starts okay. with a J. <laughs> my question is, I just saw the movie Max Rose last night and with Jerry Lewis, I guess, making his comeback, and it started centering on an object that his wife had held for so many years, right? So that became a story. He wanted to find out the story behind it. So I was wondering, did you ever ask your father uh, about that gold box, what the significance of it was? No. <laughs> you know, my dad was an interesting guy. Wasn't particularly close to him. Um, and I think by the time my mom passed on, he was not well and then he passed on soon after. So I never heard the story but really what it is, is the evidence. It's just a gold box. And I've, you know, the, what's beautiful about it is I've been able to put all of my imaginings in it and all of my belief that there was great love between them um, that wasn't manufactured by the studio, that was their natural, gorgeous, young, talented selves loving each other for the time that they did. And although by the time I came around, I like to refer myself as the save the marriage baby who failed. Um, but you know, you feel that way. I mean, truth be told, you feel that way. And I still, no matter what, do believe that, you know, obviously there was great love between them and we have a legacy of their work to enjoy forever. So I just look at that golden box as a, like a little personal, uh, example of who they were, what they were able to achieve from nothing. My mother and father were both born poor, and my father was from New York City, the son of a tailor. My mother lived in a garage in Merced, California, and they both became huge worldwide movie stars, authors, uh, political people, important, registered to vote, please. And um, whoever you're voting for, register to vote. Um, so I like to look at that little golden box and just look at them as Janet, that Tony loved Janet and Janet loved Tony and they loved us and that's sort of what's important for me. Thank you. Hi. Um, from listening to you speak, it's um, apparent and wonderful uh, that family is a very important thing to you. Um, and not just your family, but family is a, a general no question. Um, thing. So I was just wondering what it was like to have an opportunity to work professionally with your mother. Was that a fun thing or was there any sort of uh, nervousness associated with that? Yeah. So my mom was the legendary Janet Lee and uh, an extraordinary talent. You know, by the time I worked with her, I'll tell you two things. I did the movie Halloween and then nothing happened. Oh, thank you. But. And then nothing happened, and I mean nothing happened, meaning I couldn't get any work, even though it was a fairly big success. And the only work I got was two things before John Carpenter wrote the part in The Fog for me, which then launched me into basically horror movies for a while, um, which gave me my life, which I'm grateful for forever. But um, when I didn't get any work and I needed to work, as an actor, here's what I did. I got an episode of The Love Boat <laughs> where I played my mother's daughter. Now, you have to remember something. I was the daughter of famous people. The movie Halloween should have given me some established cred of my own. The first and only job, the first of two jobs I got post doing Halloween, I played my mother's daughter on a love boat episode. <laughs> the second job I got 
was I played basically Nancy Lopez on an episode of Charlie's Angels, <laughs> where I was Cheryl Ladd's best friend and we wrestled alligators in a little river. <laughs> At the point of working with my mother on that, obviously I was frustrated. Um, when we made the movie Halloween H2O, which was really my way of saying thank you to all the fans of that original movie 20 years later, um, uh, they asked if they, would, if they felt comfortable with me having my mom be in the movie. And I said, at that point, of course, it would be an honor to have my mother come in and, and uh, do a little cameo. So if for anybody here who's ever seen that movie, my mother, um, uh, plays uh, the assistant to the principal, and I was the principal of the school, and when she, her last scene in the show, she's going to her car um, in this outdoor area of the school, and we have a scene, and when she goes to her car, it's the exact car that she drove in the movie Psycho. So for those who haven't seen H2O, I think that's called a uh, Easter egg, right? Young people, help me out here. Okay, it's an Easter egg. Thank you all Whatever. for coming. Anyway.